Welcome back to our study of 2 Kings. In this session, we're going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 23. We won't get to the whole chapter, but we will cover the rest of the story of Josiah. Now, this is a fascinating chapter. Uh, we get some significant insight into what has been going on in Judah in terms of the sins of the kings and the idolatry that they've led the people in and just how deep that goes, uh, as well as something significant that had been left out uh, by the kings of Israel for a long time that they had failed to do that Josiah is actually the first king to do. We'll see that toward the end. So let's dig in here. Second Kings chapter 23 the beginning, in verse, beginning in verse 1, says, Then the king sent, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord, to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. Now let's pause there and remember what's going on here. Back in the previous chapter, Josiah had given instructions for the temple to be restored or repaired. And while that process was going on, the book of the law was found in the temple. Evidently, it had been lost because when uh, they found it, they, it was a significant event. The book was read out to the king, Josiah. Josiah was grieved when he heard what the book said, not because what the book said was bad, but because he realized that what God's people had been doing was bad, that they had not been living according to God's law. So he was grieved by that and is determined to uh, remedy that and respond appropriately to God's word. And so he gathers all these people, right? It says small and great. All these people come together and the king himself reads out this book of the covenant, this book of the law. And they all respond, right? So one thing this reminds us of right off the bat is how important it is for us to hear and to heed God's word. When they had not heard God's word, when it had been neglected and lost, they strayed from what God had told them to do because they weren't being reminded of it. Or in some cases, perhaps they didn't even know because they hadn't heard. But we need to be reminded what God says. We need to hear what God says. So we need to give attention to God's word. We can't neglect it. We can't leave it off in some corner of our house or corner of our life uh, to be discovered years later as though it has been lost. We need to hear it regularly so that we can remember what God wants us to do so that then we can walk in the ways that God wants us to walk. And that's what the king and the people decide to do here. They make a covenant, a promise, a vow, right? A so they make a solemn decision uh, before the Lord to commit themselves to doing what God has said to do in his word. So then verse 4 says, And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the threshold to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the hosts of heaven. Notice that. They brought those things out of the temple. In the temple were things for worshiping false gods, for worshiping Baal, for worshiping Asherah, for worshiping the hosts of heaven, that is worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars and so on. Those things were in the very temple itself where God dwelt, where God had placed his name. The place that was set apart as holy for him had been used for the worship of idols. So those things were taken out. And it says he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. And then it goes on, verse 5, And he deposed the priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to make offerings in the high places at the cities of Judah and around Jerusalem, those also who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and the moon and the constellations, and all the hosts of the heavens, 
So those priests are relieved of duty. They're fired. They're not needed anymore because God has set apart the temple as the place where he is supposed to be worshipped, not on these high places. And he has forbidden idolatry. And so all of that is over now. No more idolatry. No more worshipping the hosts of heaven and so on. So those priests are uh, deposed, it says. And then verse 6, it says, And he brought out the Asherah from the house of the Lord outside Jerusalem to the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron and beat it to dust and cast the dust of it upon the graves of the common people. Now, we know when uh, Caesar uh, crossed the Rubicon, right, that he burned the boats. Uh, no more going back, right? We are determined to go forward. In the same way here, Josiah is indicating that this idolatry is done with. We're not just storing these idols somewhere else for now because Josiah wants to put an end to idolatry, but who knows? Maybe the next king will want to restore it, so we should save these things. No, they are being burned. Their ashes are being strewn. There is no going back to this idolatry as far as Josiah is concerned. Verse 7, And he broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes who were in the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the Asherah. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had made offerings from Geba to Beersheba. And he broke down the high places of the gates that were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on one's left at the gate of the city. However, the priests of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brothers. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no one might burn his son or his daughter as an offering to Molech. So he's defiling these places so that no one will want to worship there anymore, where they've been worshiping these false gods. He even has to deal with uh, the possibility of child sacrifice getting rid of the opportunity for that is that's what uh, one of the ways that one of these false gods was worshipped was through child sacrifice. No more of that. Verse 11, and he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. Notice that the kings of Judah who were supposed to lead the people to obey God's law, to listen to God, to do what God says. They had dedicated horses and chariots to the sun as though the sun were a god to be worshipped and honored. So he's getting rid of those. Um, It says, At the entrance to the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain which was in the precincts, that's where he removed those horses. Um, And it goes on, it says, And he burned the chariots of the sun with fire, and the altars on the roof of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars that Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, he pulled down and broke in pieces and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. And he and the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem to the south of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, and for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Now notice this. He is dealing with idolatry that goes all the way back to King Solomon, and that's significant. Not because idolatry in Israel began with Solomon, it didn't. We know about idolatry all the way back in Exodus 32 when Israel made the golden calf. But it was when Solomon's heart was turned away from the Lord by his foreign wives, right, whom he began to build places of of, uh, worship for, for their gods. When that happened, right, that's why God divided the temple divided the the kingdom after Solomon's death into the north and south Israel and Judah and that was the beginning of this uh trajectory of idolatry that's traced throughout first and second kings is um, Solomon the end of Solomon's reign was back around first kings 11 and now we're almost at the end of second kings and from the beginning of Israel breaking off from Judah in the north under Jeroboam after the death of Solomon, uh, there was idolatry in Israel. But also throughout uh, Judah, uh, there were at least periods of idolatry. Um, And so this is going back all the way to that dividing line in the reign of Solomon and dealing with the idolatry that's traced all the way back there. 
it's crazy that those things were still around, that they had never been dealt with, never been fully and finally removed until Josiah did it. Verse 15, and he broke in pieces the pillars and cut down the asherim and filled their places with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar at Bethel, the high place erected by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, that altar with the high place he pulled down and burned, reducing it to dust. He also burned the Asherah. So there, now he's not only gone back to address the idolatry of Solomon, he's also gone into the region of Israel, which Israel's already been taken into exile because of their idolatry. That was back in 2 Kings 17. But now he's going into the territory of Israel and dealing with their idolatry. Remember, Jeroboam set up those two golden calves, one at Bethel and one in the north, uh, so that the people of Israel would worship there instead of going back to Jerusalem. And even though they've been carried off into exile, that idolatry has not been dealt with. And so now Josiah is dealing with that as well. Even though he's the king of Judah, he's dealing with the idolatry that was present in Israel. And then it says, verse 16, And as Josiah turned, he saw the tombs there on the mount. And he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it, according to the word of the Lord that the man of God proclaimed who had predicted these things. Now, it's been so long since we read that story, I had forgotten what took place. But if you go all the way back to 1 Kings chapter 13, a prophet comes and tells Jeroboam, who has established this idolatry at Bethel, he tells King Jeroboam what is going to happen. I'll just read a portion of it. It says, Behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings, and the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. So what Josiah is doing, and the fact that Josiah is doing it, is the fulfillment of what was prophesied all the way back in chapter 13 in the days of Jeroboam generations ago. God is fulfilling his word. God is bringing to pass what he said would happen to the altar set up by Jeroboam. Then it says, verse 17, Then he said, what is, the, what is that monument that I see? And the men of the city told him, It is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and predicted these things that you have done against the altar of Bethel. So that prophecy evidently had been passed down because those men knew about it and remembered it, even though it had been a long time ago. And he said, that monument there, that, that's, that's set up to the prophet who prophesied the things that you're now doing. So it says, verse 18, and he said, let him be, let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came out of Samaria. And Josiah removed all the shrines also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which was the capital of Israel, which kings of Israel had made, provoking the Lord to anger. He did to them according to all that he had done at Bethel. And he sacrificed all the priests of the high places who were there on the altars and burned human bones on them. Then he returned to Jerusalem. Now that sounds pretty uh, gruesome, right? But that's the same kind of thing that Elijah did in his day when he faced down the prophets of Baal. He slaughtered them, right? That was uh, the judgment that came upon them for them leading the people in idolatry. Now, here's the thing that may be most surprising. It's pretty disturbing to find out how deep the idolatry went, even in Judah, even in the temple that Josiah had to clean out. But here's something else that we probably didn't realize wasn't happening, that was supposed to be happening, that Josiah is the first king to do. It says in verse 21, And the king commanded all the people, Keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. For no such Passover had been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel or during all the days of the kings of Israel or the kings of Judah. Now, of course, the first Passover happened when God delivered Israel from Egypt. They were supposed to sacrifice the lamb and put the blood on the doorposts so that God's judgment would pass over them when the 
death of the firstborn happened that night. And then Pharaoh told them to go and they departed. And their whole calendar was built around that. Exodus 12 tells us that the Passover uh, was going to happen in the first month. That was going to be the first month of the year for them. So this is supposed to be a big deal in Israel's life. And they're supposed to remember it every year. But now we're told that not since the days of the judges has the Passover been observed, not by a single king in Israel or in Judah have the people been led to keep the Passover. That means not even David kept the Passover and led the people to keep the Passover. Not even Solomon, not even Hezekiah. Only Josiah leads the people to keep the Passover where they remember how God had delivered them from Egypt. Verse 23 says, But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was kept to the Lord in Jerusalem. First time in a long time. Verse 24, Moreover, Josiah put away the mediums and the necromancers and the household gods and the idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might establish the words of the law that were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. This is huge, right? This is why Josiah is doing all this. He made a covenant before God. He's going to do what God said. And God has forbidden idolatry. God has commanded the keeping of the Passover. And so that's why he's doing these things. He's not just hearing God's word. He's also seeking to do God's word. Uh, that's what a king is supposed to do, right? A king in Israel or a king in Judah is supposed to do. Then it says, verse 25, Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. Now, if we had read that before reading the verses right before it, we might think, oh, I don't know. I mean, maybe it means none of the kings before him except for David. But no, not even David did what Josiah did. Only Josiah led the people to keep the Passover. Josiah turned to the Lord wholeheartedly, more so than any king before or after him, more so even than David, who was a man after God's own heart. Here's the bad news, though, verse 26. Still the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath by which his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel. And I will cast off this city that I have chosen, Jerusalem, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. It's never too late to repent. It's never too late to turn back to the Lord. But sometimes it is too late to escape the consequences. The consequences of Judah's idolatry are coming. They are going to be exiled. The temple is going to be destroyed. God is not going to turn back from that. That is going to happen. But that does not mean that Josiah's turning to the Lord was fruitless or worthless or too late. It was good. It honored God. It was the right thing to do. But it didn't mean that, it, that Judah could escape what they had brought on themselves by their idolatry up to that point. The story of Josiah ends this way, verse 28. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. King Josiah went to meet him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo as soon as he saw him. And his servants carried him dead in a chariot from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in his father's place. So Josiah didn't have to see the exile. He didn't have to see the destruction of the temple. But it is still going to come. But nonetheless, Josiah stands right as an example, an encouragement, a, a reminder of how important it is for us not only to listen to God's word, but to respond to God's word and to respond rightly, to do what God says, to believe that God means what he says, to believe that what God says is good for us and so that we should 
follow it and act on it. We need to hear the word. We need to be reminded what God says frequently. We don't want to neglect or lose God's word by you know, stashing it away in a corner somewhere and failing to hear it. We need to hear God's word and then we need to respond God's, to God's word. And sometimes that means repentance. Sometimes that means returning, turning back to God, recognizing that what we've been doing has been wrong and now we want to do what is right. And the good news is that God loves to forgive us, to cleanse us. The Bible promises that if we confess our sin, or that he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's never too late to repent. It's never too late to turn to the Lord. So hear God's word. And if there's a place you need to repent, turn back to God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength like Josiah did. May the Lord bless you. Amen.